And just to start things off, I think the first thing I'd like to just tell everybody is this is a user group meeting. This isn't Brad gives a speech. So what I'd really like to encourage, and I know that it's hard, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning, but I'd absolutely like to encourage you to participate, share some ideas, tell me every time I click that button it does something I don't know what it does. Whatever that is, let's talk about it. Maybe you got some things that are going on. Uh, for those people that are new, I realize you maybe don't know much about March Master, and that's okay. What I want you to see is the room full of people, and there's an awful lot of knowledge. There's a full range of businesses here from uh, small single store owners that, uh, that buy a small piece of their business from Do It Best to huge multi-store conglomerates that, uh, that run 50, 100 stores. So there is a full range of people in the room. So whatever your issue is, somebody else in the room probably has a similar type thing going on. So anybody have anything that they're willing to share that's happened on Margin Master in the last six months in their business, particularly those of you that are new users within the last year? Anybody just finishing implementation? Come on, <laughs> You haven't finished implementation? You, you haven't finished implementation. Well, no, but, but so let's say you're 85% done. Anybody? Come on, you guys, I know it's you. Don't make me come over there. Because <laughs> I, know you, I know you guys are close. So, so through the process, I think one thing that's encouraging to everybody, anybody that's been through the price change process and revised or stuff, has anybody ever run into some negative feedback from their customers that they did something wrong? Has anybody got a negative story about my customers perceive something wrong? Well, how about like a, you know, half-inch, five-eighths? and relationships type thing. Yeah. So so somebody complained about that, that was before or after you did the implementation? After. So if you did the implementation and you ended up with bad runs and relationships, yeah. we followed the implementation. Because that should that's absolutely one of the staples. So everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say runs and relationships. So the idea that the speed board bits need to make sense as they go from small to big. And and the same thing's true with a lot of products that we sell. They have to have logic between the sides. It doesn't necessarily mean that rounding always makes sense. While well, we always like to talk about rounding, and we will. Uh, the most important thing with most prices is that they make sense to the item text. Right here. How many people did more than 5,000 price changes per store? Most of you. So, yeah, if you, were, if you could go from start to finish, more than 5,000. How many did more than 10,000? More than 15,000? Still some hands up. More than 20,000. How many of you did pretty much every item in this book? So for those of you that are new users, that's a common thing. Every item needs to change, and not necessarily is every item going to go up. That's an important thing to recognize. In fact, I tell you the general rule of thumb is you're going to see about two-thirds of the items that will increase, a third of those items will come down. Basically what's happening is nothing's changing to the process other than the price change component. So if you've used IMCS or MVP or some other program that's been released over the years to establish retail prices, okay, so when you're, before you print your stickers, if they come on the truck or wherever they come from, whatever you use to do that, stop it. Margin Master takes that away. Now the idea is, and the thing that do it best is absolutely behind, is the idea that, number one, they aren't in the sticker printing business. So if you're getting your stickers on the truck today, that's really something they don't want to do. And I think they might not come out and specifically say, we don't want to do that, but I'll tell you right now, they don't want to do that. And I think from, from a logic perspective, it's easy to understand why. Take 4,500 stores and have to have the facilities and the printers and the manpower and everything in place to put all the stickers that you could buy a $200 laser printer and do at your store yourselves, why would they do that? 
and then which stickers do you want? And they got to print extra stickers. And then if it's just price change stickers, which price? The maintenance of that system, well, maybe in your own mind for your store, seems like a relatively simple process. From a corporate level, it is a very expensive and very hard to maintain process. So that goes away, and we transfer everything then to the store. So whether you have a point of sale system or not, whatever your point of sale system is, hopefully your printing price changes from your point of sale system. You're doing electronic communications, you update details, you print price changes, right? Standard, standard flow. If you have margin master, the change there is is only slight. And then we download the electronic communications. Margin master reviews our retails, puts them back into our point of sale system, assuming we have one. Now we print off our changes. So there's just a little extra little leg of the process. Total time to do that varies a little bit based on what point of sale system you have. Everybody, does everybody not have a point of sale system here? I'll quit talking about non point of sale because everybody's got a point of sale. Okay, we'll quit talking about that. Just so you know, if you're, if you're thinking about getting rid of your point of sale system, you can use Market Master without a point of sale system. We, won't, we don't need to cover that. Okay, so I don't know, does that kind of address the question? So, yeah. so things that change. They absolutely uh, are still going to provide electronic communications to your point of sale system. Because your point of sale system is always, with Market Master without, is always the king of knowledge for your business. It knows everything about every item. It knows what the co current cost is. It knows what the sales history is. And when it goes to the point of sale, it knows what the right retail price is, despite what Margin Master knows. So what all Margin Master is doing is taking a snapshot of what that information is. We're using that to manipulate it. And then we want to put it right back in the point of sale system. I wish it was that easy for some point of sale system. But some systems, it's very some It's one click, honestly. It's click it in, click it out, and it's done. That's the way ideally it would be for everybody. OK? Any other questions on, on that? Yes. Not related to that, but we found that conversion would do the best pricing and everything in Market Master or POS was I mean, it's pretty easy overall. Our greatest challenge, and I'd like to maybe hear from my colleagues here, is and give some advice from you, Brad, is how is a good effective way to deal with those purchases you make outside the good best round? That yeah. has been our biggest Look at that. challenge. That's on the list. When I get my agenda, you'll see number two there, Rival Master. So we'll, we'll spend some time on Rival Master. That certainly piques a lot of people's interest, and it's why a lot of you are even here. So I get that. So we will get to that. That's, that's something I definitely want to talk about, because when I talk about it, it's important how everybody understands what that is and what that's going to be. And we're on an ethical system. So, so back to your first question. non do it best items. Critical for everybody. Everybody's got them. Um, how's, how's somebody handling them? Somebody got a strategy? Somebody got something they're doing? Before I share my ideas. <coughs> None of you have them. No, we, we have steel. I do it. We do it the same way. Steel? We use the non, the, the button to go non, non do the best use. The only, the only thing there is you still have to deal with the same set of rules. So you got to kind of customize it when you're doing that item. So it's not going to go in the center here, so you're not going to go in Process. process, but with, with with still it's mostly a parts thing. And I set up a rule for that class, and it just goes that way. Steel steel is a good example. And I'm here to I sell a lot of steel power equipment in my stores. Um, if you're selling an outside vendor's stuff, there's a couple things you can do in Margin Master that maybe you haven't thought of or, or been made aware of. We're talking about just flipping the flag as they show me the non do the best SKUs. Simple enough to look at them. But obviously, I can't take a non do it best item and say set it to a do it best retail. So that's a disconnect. But what I can do, and Steel's a good example, we use Brian Equipment out of Cincinnati or Cleveland, uh, and they send us their annual catalog and they'll send it to you in a, in a text a computer file that can easily be loaded into Margin Master. And guess what happens when I know what their suggested retails are? I can load them into Margin Master. So now parts is a great example. Why on a Steel uh, sprocket? That they suggest a retail of $9.69. Why I would sell it at $9.69 is beyond me. You know, that's that's $12.99. It's, it's certainly not their price. Their prices give you about that 28 to 30 percent margin. Are you kidding me? Have you seen the parts that we carry? We are worth more, and besides that, we're the only one in town to sell those parts. So I use their suggested retail, just like we do at Best Retail, 
and I mark those up 15 to 20 percent depending on the category of parts, add some rounding in, that's our price. For every item that's in our system, that's how we do it. Now, there's, there's a trick to that, because this works for car hard, it works if you sell fishing tackle, uh, it works anything that you sell where there's a vendor that provides map pricing or suggested retails. The hardest part of this whole deal is there has to be a connection between your item number and their number. It can be, in, in our case, we use the steel you know, 434 part number, that's our steel. So there's a pretty direct conversion. But a lot of people set that up and they've got an eight digit number for the steel number. There is no way for the computers to know what that relationship is. So if it's a car part number and it translates to this number in your system, how do we match those together? So what I tell everybody, look, it might be a big job, but in some categories it's worth re, re either changing your SKUs or setting them up with the same SKU that the vendor uses. And somebody will say, well, it's the same as a new best SKU. All right, then put a C in front of it if it's car hard. Do something to make it so that it's consistently the same idea. C, one, two, three, four, five, is the same as Carhartt's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so there's always a way to do it. But you gotta think of a little strategy about that, how to get it done in advance. Where else does that make sense? Uh, in lumber, in, in uh, we think of pre-finished moldings. You got racks of pre-finished moldings. Uh, they're all there and they're all in the different colors. They don't generally change those prices on a weekly basis. They're maybe changed once a year maybe twice a year if it's a crazy year. So take those items, get them set up so that you can import what their suggested retails are if they're giving that. Uh, if your wholesale, whoever's doing that is giving it. Just change your retails all at one time and you don't have to redo that import process every week. So in other words, if I did my steel pricing today, I'm good. They aren't releasing new prices for another six months. So I don't have to redo that every single time. It's kind of a secondary process of margin master. So any questions on that? So we're talking about a custom import in Margin Master, which a lot of you have never seen, but all of the information that's in Margin Master, whether it's a do it best item or a not a do it best item, keep in mind it's just letters and numbers. And one of the greatest things about computers and technology is if you've got letters and numbers, you can generally get them in and out of programs. I know some of your point of sale systems, it's not that easy, but generally you can get it in and out. And once we get it in and out, if you think of an Excel spreadsheet, we all tend to understand the Excel spreadsheet. Once I have things in that column and row format, now I can start to manipulate it. That's all Margin Master is doing. So what information do you have? Do you have a, a spreadsheet that you created that's one of your, it's, it's Bill's hardware down the street and you've got their lumber pricing. You've written down all their dimensional prices in a spreadsheet. Bring it into Margin Master and it'll show right next to your price. And we can show you how to do that. We're not going to do that today show you how to do that. Any pieces of information, it always hinges on your SKU. So you generally want to have your SKU, if you're multi-store, you want to have your SKU in your store. That's the unique identifier for each item in your system. Okay, yes? What about UPC? Do you match UPCs? We, we do not match UPCs in Margin Master, but we can match UPCs on an import. That's a little bit more advanced topic, but so if you had a list of UPCs, here's the, here's the trick with UPCs. Most point of sale systems support multiple UPCs per SKU. And most point of sale systems also don't enforce that a UPC can only be used once. So if I've got two SKUs with the same UPC on it, and, and you probably know what I'm talking about, which one's the right one? Completely violates all rules of UPCs, but most point of sale systems have no, nothing to enforce that by. So, we have the ability, if you want to say, here's my list of UPCs and the SKUs they go to, Margin Master can work with that. When we then get a UPC, it'll, it'll look back up and say, here's, here's the SKU that's associated with that. But if there's a problem or there's a duplicate, duplicate, now we got an issue. So I'm a little leery about that. But it is changing, particularly with things like Rival Master, and we'll look at that later. Okay, yes? Something we run into is units of measure. Yes. Say like wire and you get a thousand foot spool, you how exactly, how some of the people handling that issue? Like who's got, a, a, who's got a, a unit of measure fix? Anybody? Because when you do, you're going to be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would tell you that in this industry, there is no bigger screw up than this multiple selling unit issue. Why is this so hard? Whether I buy it in a pallet, a roll, a case, a pack, a foot, whatever it is, why can't I sell it the right way? 
it's not, you're not unique. Here's, here's I guess, my advice. Because there is no, and again, by point of sale system, some systems handle it better than others. Uh, but generally, when Do It Best publishes their information, they have a standard unit of measure, which is their default retail. That's the standard unit. So in, in the case of wire, it's the box. Most people today are still selling wire by the foot. If you're cutting it, that box price means nothing to you. So what I suggest to everybody, though, is because Margin Master is set to use the standard unit. It doesn't, it doesn't have any way to know necessarily what you're using, unfortunately. Um, I think that's something that we're going to address in, in the near future. But again, it's going to vary by every point of sale system, so we can't really make a blanket fix. But one of the ways to fix that is, is always adopt what they've accepted as the standard unit. So where that's a mess is if you switch from true value or you switch to do it best from the ace and you've got an old unit of measure of the foot and now it's a box but you've got your skew still set up that way. It can be set up in most systems to do the conversion for you, but it screws up retail pricing every time. And you know that that's why everybody's not in the So the problem with those skews, and, and the good news is there's generally only a couple hundred of them in a typical store. If there's 200, if there's 500 of those skews in your store, what I would really suggest is let's delete them, let's re-add them the right way so they're set up the way the do it best says that they sell it, and then let's make our alternate selling unit the one that we want to use. So when we sell wire, we sell it by the foot, but we price the, the generic price is by the foot. It's a pain in the butt, and there's just no, there's no position. If, if you're an Epicor user and you're using multiple selling units, uh, you, can, you can set up a multiple selling unit to go from the foot up to the roll, or from the roll down to the foot. So you can accommodate both scenarios. It's just a question of which one are you going to do. Anybody, has anybody had any other solutions to that? Has anybody been through that? Does anybody think that they've got their, their order multiples uh, working the way they want? You, you got one? What would you get? You guys do? Well, we're using rock solid. And that surprisingly it works pretty well. Yeah. Just, you just have to, I mean, you can, you just, you just order and receive and everything based on what do a best wants and then choose whatever your primary selling unit is. Um, and it, it works. And then when you do, um, when you do Martin Master, just you kind of throw it out. I mean, you, 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 you can kind of, you kind of pay attention to it, but it doesn't help that much because like most of the stuff, it's probably you're dealing with cases. You're dealing with case pricing. It has very little to do with right. your individual pricing. And the way that Rock Solid deals with it is if you change your case price, your unit price will will go like by percentage will match that. So if you say, okay, well, the roll of wire is now sixty nine ninety nine, now my unit price makes no sense. So what you're gonna have to do is just know these are your hundred SKUs and deal with those and then just so you just you kind of leave them out. Like you might use it as a as a reference. You might be like, oh my wire went up, I need to deal with that. But don't probably not make any changes. Follow the logic. No, yeah. I would agree with you. I think in, our, in, in my stores, I think what we do is we have it set up with a user code, and we just periodically run that list and say, look, do these make sense? Is something screwed up? Because they do the same thing. They'll screw up and, and be the wrong price. But the good news is most of those aren't changing price very often. There's been very little inflation in hardware's item pricing in the last number of years. Most of the items are commodities. So it's, it's electrical wire, it's, it's pipe, it's things like that. So, so follow their lead. I'm with you. Rock is doing it okay, but you still got it. We can't make all the pain go away. Yes? Can you just download the case quantity and have your point of sale run the factors <coughs> of the algebraic equation in order yeah, to create kind of the unit? That's kind of what we're saying, but if you take a, a thousand foot spool of Romex wire and you're selling it by the foot, a thousand foot price is whatever, $1,200 right. um, retail. So what's the factor to get down to the per foot price? If you say it's 0.0001% or, you know, what is it? The math doesn't deliver a nice retail. It surely doesn't deliver one that's rounded the way we probably like it to be. It might deliver uh, 11.2 cents or something crazy. And if the price goes up then $10 on that thousand foot roll, what happens to your each price? It's not always a clear mathematic thing. It's just the numbers don't, don't work all the time. Now I would tell you in, in the Epicor system, Get away, we do it. There are some of them that we'll set it up. We don't care about the full roll price, and we plug the per foot price. Just plug it, and just know that we gotta check them once in a while. Dangerous, but like you said, there's there's about 100, 100, there might be 200 in the store. So if you got 200 of those items, we can check those every couple months and just say, is 
there anything you want to ask? Yes. The way we currently do it is we can have two separate margins, so we just have the margin higher, obviously, right. on the per foot price. But it, I was just wondering if there was, like, you know, a better. It would be nice to have something. <laughs> no, we're making notes back there. something that we just tried to figure out and unfortunately it's so inconsistent across all the different point of sale systems maybe, maybe what the easier answer is there tell me all the time tell me what things have changed in those items in the last 30 days and, and that can almost be accomplished today and if we just look at this real quick on your more selections tab you had this last skew change date you know that's that's the last time that the retail price changed from do it best so if you were to pull up a category of electrical wire, class 350 or whatever it is, and say give me everything with a last chain date greater than, what, two months ago, it'll only show you the things that changed in the last two months. So if you're only trying to do that process once a month, again, something outside of your normal flow, but it needs to see a list. Here's the things that change retail that are on my list of, of selling unit issues. So it, it's, it's attainable, it's just a lot. Sorry. Yes. You notice the, the vendor costs when you, you, know, you can show vendor costs in there. It doesn't necessarily always match the, the class or the part. Is there a way to see class being part of the multiple of the Two things are happening. Let me hold off on that. Okay, so he's asking about seeing the different costs. So the cost that's in Margin Master now for vendor cost is the <coughs> highest of the three costs. So there's par, vision, classic cost. The one that's displayed here is whatever the highest is. So in the case of those selling unit, whatever the highest one is, that's the cost that's going to be there. The cost that Margin Master uses for its calculations is the cost that comes from your point of sale system. So the do it best cost is only a reference number. Don't, don't look at that and think, oh man, something's wrong. But that is the replacement cost. Now depending on what your buying arrangement is with do it best and what your rebate structure is, I don't even fully understand that, you could be in one of those different columns as far as what your cost is. Okay, so it's not necessarily meant to be that. In the next version of Margin Master that we're going to talk about later, you get to choose which one of those costs you want to see. They're all three there, but you can you can choose which one you want to see. Um, I don't know how people use that. Some people use that as just a point of reference to make sure, hey, this is where the cost is going to be. Some point of sales system need that information. So a lot of different things. But so right now it's the highest of the three. But coming soon you'll be able to pick which one you want. Okay, so if you know your classic cost, that's what that that novel. Yes. I like you explain the price sensitivity. Uh, on my system, it's A, B, C, D, X, and C is competitive and B is line. Uh, when I'm selecting items from the good best, you know, I'm looking at sensitivity of those items, and maybe the right item uh, doesn't show up. So, so in Do It Best, so this is this is one of the little rubs I had when we did Do It Best. So when we first got set up with sensitivity codes at Do It Best. Do It Best didn't want to follow the mold of everybody else. But what they decided to do is rather than use what we had done internally was use the blind, B is blind, C is competitive, S is sensitive. So you could look at the letter and kind of remember what it is. They came up with A, B, C, D. I don't know which one's which. I still don't. The problem is when you look at this screen, this is exactly what you're referencing. I'm assuming I've got to do a best story in here. This still shows, this is a demo data. So it shows the B, C, N, S. Well, do it best goes A, B, C, D. So the B in do it best world loads into B as blind, but it's not necessarily blind. It's B. <laughs> so it's changing. Okay, that's changing as well in the new program, in the new version. And so we'll go through that. If, if it would help, I will find out and you send me an email and tell me what is ABCD, I can look that up for you and tell you what ABCD is. I think A is the most sensitive. So A is sensitive, B is next, C, D, D is blind. In do it best world, is that correct? Yeah. That's, that's the logic that was used back then. And unfortunately, the little pop-up tool tip, you know, I think the only one that pops up on is the B. There is nothing that pops up on the other ones. That's the same. Well, you can use it, it's just you've got to know that B, when it says that it's blind, B is B. <laughs> That's all. So it's, it, it'd be what I can say would equate to sensitive. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I, now, one of the things that I can do, and how many people use sensitive, sensitivity codes in your strategies? Do you use those? So most of you do. 
So I, when this came up two years ago, and we recognized that they've got ABCD and we use BCNS, we could have changed it. I could very easily map and say, all right, their A is now a B. But where that falls apart is anybody that's got that in a rule and it says, just show me the items that are C's, which ones, which C do you want to see? Do you want to see my C or their C? So that's why we left it. So does it look at their best C? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's looking at what their code is. Their codes are correct and their code, that's why I said you can still use it. Just the only thing that's wrong is what pops up here is, is the name. That's the only thing that's wrong. Okay. Sorry. What else? Good, some good topics. Anybody got anything else before I jump on? Yes. Yeah, uh, it's probably too rudimentary, but um, when you when you're thinking of price strategy and you have several items that constantly pop up and you know that like whatever it is, like these these four items in this in this particular query are always way off, and I've got to fix it. How can you fix, how can you address those and save those? Does that make any sense? Save them as you just, don't want to adjust them. You well, will. like 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 I look at this, and every time I run this report, do it best is a hundred bucks more than it needs to be on this on these four items. Yep. And I want to somehow highlight these items or exclude these items from the list. Or whatever, so that way, like, like take do a best retail and subtract twenty percent, but everything else take do a best retail and add twenty percent. Well, if, if if those four items are truly on an island by themselves, so yeah. maybe they're in a, a whole department of items, they're just four, and they're not really related, they're not from the same vendor, they're not uh, they're not in some subcategory that's the same. If if there's no other commonality between those, you have really two choices. One is to make four skew level exceptions. Okay, and the skew level exception says. On this item, let's, let's look at one. Uh, on this item, let's always go to do it best retail, less less twenty percent. I can't remember because I'm looking at non-do it best items now. So if we're looking at this item and for whatever reason it's not related, I can create that skew level exception for that item. I realize it's hard for you to see probably, or I can do the same things that I can do at the group or department level. But I can set the price to do a best retail level one, plus or minus. I can change the rounding scheme. Or if they're truly things that I just don't want to look at anymore, just, we know that we handle that at the shelf or whatever it is, just have to create a skew level rule that says always set those things. I guess scroll down there, set it to zero. So if I saved it right there, that would that would automatically save it into this as a skew level. So yes. that's the part. So if you go back one screen. Like just to hit the cancel button. So that's where it was. So I was going through there and I was like, well, it, you know, I can adjust it, but I can't save it. And that's what I was not seeing. It's, so there it's it is. Just, <laughs> just create the skill. So, yeah. watch, so watch what happens here. No, I, I see it now. That's all. That's all. If we do this and we say we want to go to zero and we save <coughs> that, okay, what it's done is it saved the rule that that thing's always going to zero, which we know what zero is, don't change. So therefore, because now that skew level rule, let me get out of here my strategy and I go to my skew level exceptions, I've got one of them. There it is right there and it tells me that this skew is being set to a zero retail. So no matter what happened in the prior parts of the strategy, take those four items and just, we're not there. Thanks. Problem solved. Okay. All right, cool. Let's just jump in. I'm just going give to you, give you what I had for an agenda when I, when I thought I was going to have a projector. So I just want to talk about the new Margin Master real quick. Then we're going to jump into Rival Master and talk about some of the things that are going on there. And that immediately leads into Pricing Master, which some of you have heard of, seen maybe before, if you really scour our website, maybe you've seen it. We can always have open topics, we can talk about whatever. If we have time, I'm just going to go through some tips and tricks, and that's really most useful for people that have been using Margin Master a long time, and you, you maybe stumble through some clumsy things, you think, wouldn't it be cool if I could just do this? Maybe you can, I'll just show you some things there. I, I do them all the time, so if you've seen them before, there's nothing new, they're the same tricks, but some of them are little time savers that are kind of new. So we'll get to that if we have, if we have time. Okay, so Margin Master 2. Oh, no, I have a slide for that. So Margin Master 2, as we internally are calling it, for today, for stores that don't have a point of sale system, we have created in our now in general release of Margin Master 2. It's still Margin Master. We're still 
We're not going away from the first and foremost. I'll say there's not going to be any upgrade charge. There's no fees. There's no anything. When this, when it's your time to do a conversion to the new version of the tool, it's just like any other update. It's just another update. Okay. The difference is this. Number one, the new version of Margin Master was built from the ground up. We started about maybe a little over a year ago and said, you know what, we've learned an awful lot in 10 years. What would we do differently today? And on top of that, what technological changes have happened that we can take advantage of today to really make things even better? So think just in terms of what's happened in 10 years in addition to, without being a computer program, think of how the internet has changed. And think of how the flow of information has become so readily available. Margin Master needed to take advantage of that. The old version of Margin Master wasn't really set up. Never, that just was never an option to really connect with the internet very much. So doing it in the old program is very hard, very tedious. Connecting the point of sale system is hard and tedious. And the new one gets to be much more extensible. I mean, we, can, we can add things. We can, we can say, hey, you want to know what the weather is today? Or you just put the weather on there, whatever you want to know. And there are people, by the way, that want to know what was the weather on that day and they want to track it. We aren't doing that. But you could certainly do that type of stuff today very easily. So the new version of Margin Master from a functionality standpoint its goal is to do everything that the old version of Margin Master did. And I think we're very close to having all that functionality. And then there's a couple things that we're still tweaking a little bit. But that, on top of that then, adding in some new functionality, some new data, some new sensitivity code issues, uh, resolve the cost things, uh, make the entire new best catalog and information available. What if I have items that I don't even have my point of sale? Can I do something with those UPC issues? Rival master, competitive data intelligence, all the things that you start to think of as where are we headed are coming into Margin Master 2. Okay? Margin Master. So for you today, running the existing version of Margin Master, people say to me all the time, well, when should I switch to the new one? Well, there's, today, there's not a really big, compelling reason for you to abandon ship on the old and go to the new. That said, within the next 30 days, we're going to be looking for people that are wanting to do both, maybe, or want to try it out and play with it, and say, hey, you know, I did this in the old version. It's not working quite right in the new version. Because the people that are getting the new version today are people that never had a point of sale system ever. So they don't necessarily know what they missed in the old version. So if there's a feature that's not quite there, they're much more uh, understanding. They, they don't know that they didn't have some of the things that are missing. When, you, when we start to do the changing now, the biggest downside of a change is your strategy that exists in the old version, there is no conversion. <coughs> so if you've got 25 strategy steps, they're going to have to be recreated in the new version. And why is that? It's because the, the strategy system, the way that we keep it, is completely different. It's so much cooler, so much better. We could, we could spend three or four months writing a tool to convert the old strategy, but in reality, and maybe we'll do that at some point. But from a priority standpoint, I think for most of us, if we had to recreate our strategy, it might take us an hour or two, and we'd be done. So we just decided that's not at the top of the list. The next piece then is that's coming is we, we do 41 point of sale systems in the old Margin Master. We're starting with how many different points, how many users do we have for each point of sale system? So Epicor is at the top of the list. Uh, we, have, we have something like 1,300 Epicor stores. They're, that's just the top of the list. We want them to be able to convert seamlessly. What's next is kind of, you know, we know the numbers, but if we've got somebody who's really hot to trot and they want to get going on it, they might be next on the list. That, can, that switch over process for some point of sale systems is going to change the import process completely. So today where there's an import and export of the file, down the road it might just be the click, click images. So some of the point of sale vendors have been very generous in helping us to to streamline that process. So some of you will see a change there. For a lot of you, there won't be much change at all. So we won't worry about that. Some of the cool things that are in Margin Master 2 and that are there today, particularly when we talk about the thing, let's see if I can find it. When we, when we look at Margin Master 2, this is Margin Master 2 screen. It looks the, generally the same as the screen does today. Here's one of the things that you can do. In today's thing, in today's margin master, the top section of the screen, the selection area of the screen, is fixed. You don't get any selection of what you want to see. Maybe you like to look at things differently than somebody else. 
in the new version, the ability to customize what's up at the top for selection criteria is fully at your hands. So meaning, I don't want to have my location selection on the third tab, I want to have it on the second tab. And I want to have, uh, I want to have a thing where, like, like I've got set up for this little, I want to use the new Do It Best taxonomy, which is an important category or topic for a lot of you. Uh, if you don't know what the taxonomy is, that's the department class timeline structure that Do It Best has recreated, uh, largely with this in mind, to classify items into some more similar groups. Abandon the old, get to the new. So your point of sale system still has the old structure. Margin Master will have both. So what that means to me is, I can say, look, I want to see the things that are in building supplies. And as, and as I'm making selections here, if, I, if I've got this going, why is my computer holding up? It doesn't matter. I'm not going to worry about it. I've had that going for three days. As I make selections, it <laughs> continues to refine the remaining selection boxes here for me. And it will show me as I don't necessarily know the new numbering scheme, which again, kind of like the ABCD thing, the numbers have no logic, they're just numbers. So you're now going to have class <coughs> XYZ32. What is that? Uh, nobody knows. It doesn't relate to the, the next one in the line isn't XYZ33, it's BJKCY. I, I don't know where they came up with that scheme, some really smart computer did it. So, and if he's in the room, I'm sorry. <laughs> So you can see here as, I, as I'm doing this selection, so I've, I've selected adhesives and glues. This box automatically filters down to what are the subcategories of adhesives and glues. So within, the, within adhesives and glues, I said, well, I want to see just the household glues. And I can continue to drill down, and it shows me then the final. Well, there's just super glue and super glue remover within there. It's a neat way to allow you to drill down versus the old one where you had to know what the number was, or you had to know that it's class 200. Kind of a neat thing. Now, this this living by itself, independently of what your point of sale system has pros and cons. And let's make sure we're clear about this. So most point of sale systems, some of them have done it. Transact, I know, has completed the conversion process. Epicor has a conversion tool coming. Uh, I'm not sure where the others are. Think about what happens when you try to convert your department class fine line or what they call them. Uh, group, subgroup, super subgroup. I mean, there's more different names out there for whatever that hierarchy is. When you go to convert your existing structure to a new structure, that's not an easy process. And in fact, it's, it's got a lot of hidden problems in it, I think, that maybe you're going to make you want to wait. So in the other core system, for instance, if I take all my SKUs that are in department <coughs> and say, OK, now those belong in department XYZ, I can move them all over there, but from now on, for the next 12 months, when I'm going to report on XYZ, there's no sales issue. That's a problem. So think about that before you blindly sign on the list to just make a, a blind change. How is that going to happen? Doesn't mean you're losing sales history by skew, but at the department class fine line level, sales history is gone. <coughs> is it worth it? Maybe. Maybe it is. I know that when we switched from our old point of sale system to Epcor, we went, we went for 12 months, we had no sales history report. We couldn't do it. There was no prior year, there's nothing. It's, it's kind of an awkward way to run your business because you're used to that year over year comparison. So be thinking about those things, that's not, not a concern. But what this lets us do is, is use both. So the system that's still in your structure, in your point of sale system, is absolutely here. So if I want to use my current department class fine line, great. But maybe I want to start to build rules for do it best items only, for the do it best structure, I can switch those in, in, in my leisure. Okay, so if that makes sense. So that's that's one of the things. Other things that, that happen in the tool uh, is a thing that we call really a, I think a cool tool for uh, for non do it best items in particular, and it's what we call a cost break matrix. And a cost break matrix. Let me pull up a subset of SKUs here and show you how it works. If I were to go to, uh, uh, Kelly, where's my cost break matrix? So if I go to a cost break matrix, what a cost break matrix allows me to do is create a, a hierarchical structure based on cost thresholds. Okay, remember, these are items that are not good last items, so I don't have suggested retails. In this case, I pulled up some items in the back, I pulled up 292 items. If I was going to build a cost matrix for those items, so 
So they're just generic items. We generally know that the lower the, pro lower the cost of the item, the higher the margin would be that I'd like to achieve. Right? So as the item gets higher priced, my margin shrinks. Well, what this a cost rate matrix lets me do is say, look, in this case, we set it up with, with five levels. We can change how many levels we want to have. We want to have 10 levels. How many rates do you want to have? But using the data in the background, between zero and $47, it's calculated. It tells me that the current margin on those items is 43%. But I can create a new rule that says for things with a, with a cost between zero and 47, I want to have a 52% margin. Now things between $50 and $70, I want to have a 40%. Whatever that relationship is, I can build that structure. Okay, so think again. You have to think outside of the best world, and that's hard sometimes. When we think about other items that have no place, steel parts is a great example. A steel part that costs $3 should have a 75% margin. Doesn't matter what they're telling me it is. But I can take the information and I can apply a cost break matrix. When it gets to be now it's a $200 replacement handle, all right, it's got a 30% margin. So think of being able to apply a margin to a category of items based not only on the fact that the items are in the same category, but what is the cost threshold of each item? Kind of a neat concept. Right? Uh, I see some heads shaking. I don't know if I lost you all of that. It's a little bit tricky. And where that where that came from, just so you know, is, is from international users in, in Ireland and in the UK, where they also use Margin Master. They don't have somebody like you invest. They just have costs. So when they established retail pricing, they didn't want to take the idea that all of my paint category is a 40% margin. They wanted to establish their paint margin, not just by the fact that it's paint, but it's 40, 45, 50, 55. They build that structure in place, and that's their details. Kind of a, kind of a different strategy than, than what we have necessarily at our disposal today. So completely customizable. When you enforce that, by the way, it gets checked every time. So, so think about that for not, we're talking about not doing best SKUs. Where today we were, we were kind of explaining the process of maybe periodically I'm going to check those time to a best use against some suggested retail. If I were to implement this type of a cost break structure, which I could certainly use on US items as well, but if I did that, it allows me to check them every single time we apply the margin master strategy. So they're always in, in play. <coughs> Where else does that work? Does it, does it work on sheet goods and dimensional boards? I don't know. Um, maybe some would say, look, we don't ever want to go below 5% margin on OSB. Okay. We can, you can set that rule to, to make sure that that's happening. Um, I, I'm not sure where that goes. It's just the idea of people ask for it, so I think it's kind of a neat, neat idea. So another thing that's new is something that we call minimum margins. And minimum margins is one that people have been after for a long time. Uh, minimum margin is the concept of, look, I told you that I wanted to go to do it best retail plus 3% or 5% or just do it best retail. We used to have, and we still have, I don't want there to be any price decreases. But really, what people say is, I want to be able to go to the best retail, but I don't want my margin on this item to go down. So what the tool has now, when we save a strategy step, if I created a step here and say go to the best retail, it has the option here in the middle that says, we're going to set minimum margins. So it's kind of a double whammy step. And you can see where we're going to have to have some education on this. When we set this step, it does two things. It not only takes these items and it's going to say the rule says set them to best retail, but it's also going to eat for each one of those items. It's going to calculate what is that margin that I'm starting at today. So it looks it looks at this first item. Let's, let's just apply some. So we got some numbers. Before I do that, just to get some numbers. So if I set these things to to uh, do it best retail for these 200 items, and now I'm going to save that step. Okay, so this item in the background is going to $41.99. What it does, it doesn't just record that we're going to do it best retail, it records that we're going to do it best retail, or what is this margin? So if this is a 47.6% margin, the retail will, will be recorded, the minimum retail margin will be recorded as that percent in future applications of Margin Master. We run Margin Master next week. The do it best cost goes up by 5%. Do it best retail didn't change. What do you think happens? It says, go to do it best retail. Hey, I'm already there. Wait a minute, I've got a minimum margin of 
I'm only at 46. It bumps it up. Okay, so you can see where that could be a powerful deal. As people talk about margin erosion, the idea of margin erosion is that as the costs tweak up, the corresponding suggested retails don't necessarily keep up. And that absolutely has happened over the last few years. It's not nearly as big of a problem for doing best items, though, as it is for non doing best items. And once that happens, you're going to buy around or you to What do you want it to do? Yeah, if you want to, if you want to apply rounding, rounding is absolutely a factor in that as well. So same as your, same as your other strategy. There's, there's a couple different ways that it happens, and we're not going to go into everything today. But conceptually, the idea that uh, I want to set minimum margins, I want to set maximum margins, I want to set a fixed margin by a group is also legitimate. So now imagine my pink brushes, I want them to be able to do the best retail, but I want them to have a minimum margin of 40%, a maximum margin of 60%, make it happen. So I mean, what can you think of? And let's fly around to that as well. Okay, yes? What about, you know, we do price changes, we watch the clocks go up, Fixed margin will set the margin for that at whatever it says in the middle of the screen. So if right. something's at a 47, it won't ever leave a 47. So, so what you're describing is an option to say, make this stay always that. <coughs> it's like doing a skew exception for a whole group of items at once. But it's not, it's not done. Each, each independent skew is calculated independently. <coughs> so each, so whatever they are when we set them, we're locking them in at that. So, so maybe the way that that a uh, more clear way to think, I think you're describing this. Let's take all of our paintbrushes, let's set them to do it best retail, and let's, let's set fixed margins for those going forward. Okay, so sets them to do it best retail, calculates for each item what is that margin going to be, if, if that needs retail, that's now, you're now a fixed margin for those items. Right? Yes? So basically, it's a plug margin, not plug If you retail. use this fixed margin option, it is. Right. It, it, convert, it, it effectively converts from what you set it to to <coughs> Now, what about a pricing strategy? <coughs> Say, you know, if uh, your competitor's rival watch or something like that, all of a sudden that item needs to come down, but you've got it at a set margin, so you're to, to still me, up there. To me, the set margin item option is scary. Okay. You know, but here's the problem with one of the biggest problems with margins. It doesn't prevent stupidity. <laughs> if, if you say, if you say set everything to double my price today, that's what it's going to do. There's no reality check that says, you know what, that's a really crazy rule, I can do that. And there's nothing even beyond that. There's nothing that, hey, that's what I want to do today. Six months from now, if that no longer makes sense, hey, you told it that's what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, also, when those are set, it saves the margin in, in a database, and you can bring up each SKU that you want and type in. You can set, you can, you can set that margin that was saved on each individual SKU at a later date if you want. Yeah, so, so tell them to even complicate it for this, so <laughs> just put, I just want you to get a grasp of some of the options because this is kind of cool. It's neat stuff, really. So I haven't calculated what my, my margin is today, so it's 46.2%. Well, maybe I don't need to have 46.2 be my minimum margin, but maybe I want to set it up. So I can edit those minimum margins, I can edit those margins by item going forward. I hope, I hope people don't do that too much. It's, it's doable. It's meant to provide more flexibility. It's really, really primarily meant for non do best items. I'm hoping that in the case of most do best items, you don't have to go that far. Okay? Any other questions on that? Uh, a couple other things that are, that are also new. So in addition, in addition to being able to change the top here and change what things are, are selectable and drag and drop them and put them in different places, of course, all of the columns in the middle, well, before you could add columns and remove columns, you have the ability to switch those columns around. Every column can be sorted by, uh, you can group by column. So if you want to group everything, in, you want to have subgroups of things here. You can change so much with the view. It's very 
much of modern <laughs> things like we've come to expect in other things. Uh, again, I don't know that most of us using the program on a daily basis are looking for a lot of different things to do, but there are times when somebody says, hey, we've got this many stores, we want to just look at these three stores together. So the grouping options, th there's just other things that are coming. What I miss, Kelvin, as far as highlights, what's your favorite new feature? So you put him on the spot. If you don't know Calvin, Calvin's the, the lead programmer. He does has done all of the new market masters. So, so he's pretty excited to get it in your hands. I'm sure he is, because he knows that he's going to be the first one on the phone with something that wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so let's let's just shift gears a little bit. We're an hour in already. We're doing okay. Rival Master. Most of you have heard about Rival Master have questions about Rival Master, want to hear some of you have subscribed, that's the data has started to flow. But here's Rival Master for you in, in a quick compact version. Um, basically what's happened is Retailer Soft has formed a very cool and strategic alliance with a California company uh, in that we're able to now crawl and effectively pull pricing for every Home Depot, every Lowe's, every Menards, and Amazon in the United States. Well, I shouldn't say the United States. Anywhere there's one of their stores. So what that means is, if you're in your Home Depot store and you know what their SKU number is, at the same time you're in that store and you know what that, that item is, we can tell you what their website reports that price for that item would be. People always meet and say, well, are they the same? They absolutely are the same. It's a stated goal. Store managers are mandated that their web pricing be the same as what it is. It doesn't mean it happens because we know how employees sometimes miss things, but they are supposed to be the same. But so any item that's in a Home Depot or in their catalog is available for us to crawl. Now we do keep track of that information by UPCs, which is a, a change. Um, UPCs, keeping track of Home Depot SKUs, low SKUs is a, is a treat. We have over 700,000 unique UPCs that we have, have access to that have been active within the last 12 months. 700,000, when you think about doing best carrying a measly little 70,000 SKUs, it's not a very direct relationship. And when you look at the Do It Best UPCs in comparison to the Home Depot UPCs, I think it's my next slide here. Recent check, there's 78,607. I think that's the Medallion Warehouse, I'm not sure. Um, but there are, there are about 10 and 12,000 direct 100% UPC to UPC matches from the Do It Best catalog to the Lowe's and Depot catalog. Woo we get all excited and we say, that's fantastic. Tell me 10,000 prices at Home Depot, that's great. But here's the rub. The 10,000 items where there's a direct match aren't necessarily items that you carry. So what we do with Rival Master is kind of a, a two-step process. It's a multi-step process, but the initial process is we set up a tool on your system that is extracting your UPCs. And depending again on your point of sale system, that takes many shapes, but we get a list of here's the items that we have, and here's the UPCs that we have assigned to them. Keeping in mind the idea that multiple UPCs can be assigned to a single SKU, we don't care. Okay, but if a UPC is reported to multiple SKUs, it will take the first one on the list. But most of the time that's not the issue, it's not a problem. But most SKUs have multiple UPCs. So the fact that we're selling an item today that has a UPC of XYZ1239, and they sell XYZ1238, those are different. They are not the same item in today's world. Okay, so as a manufacturer, a vendor changes a product, they typically release a new UPC number, and that new UPC number in your system, you might have the old UPC number, and when you get a catalog update, you might get the new UPC number. But now both UPC numbers relate to the same SKU, right? So the way this system works, then if you think of, we have all your UPCs, all your SKUs, so we know which UPCs you have on file, which ones you're actually selling, not which ones are the new best catalog. We then can take your items and match them up to what information do we know about Depot and Lowe's and Menards, and Amazon now has come online. When we do that, then we say, hey, taking your specific list of UPCs, we found it won't be 9,000 items unless you carry every item to do a best has, which nobody has so far. It's typically in the four or 5,000 range, so it's less. Some stores, it's far less. It depends on how much you've got. This is how many of them we have a direct match with. 
whatever those items are, if it's 5,000 items, we then, the other part of the, the sign-up process, you pick which stores you want us to tell you the pricing for. So think, how, think what that really means, because there's a, there's a lot of options out there for looking at competitor pricing and competitor intelligence, and, and you'll see more and more of this, I think, <coughs> here. Something that we view that's unique is you actually tell us the Home Depot store. And you want two Home Depot stores, I want that one and that one. It doesn't have to be a Depot and a Lowe's. When we give you the pricing, we are not giving you Home Depot pricing from the Midwest. We're not giving you some regional or the, the state of California is Home Depot, but we're not giving you that. We're giving you your store's price. And we're giving you that price for every item that you carry. And that information, depending on how you sign up, is crawled every day. Not all of them are crawled every day, because here's the, here the trick. Depot lows aren't dumb. Uh, in fact, they're both pretty smart, and I'll share with you some of the things that they're doing to make this very difficult. But Depot and Lowe's absolutely know this is going on. There are, there are a handful of companies out there that make their living scraping their information off the website and trying to resell it to people like us. So one of the things that we do is we try very hard not to set off any red flags. And when we crawl their information from their website, we're doing it from hundreds of different places. So we, we, if we did it all from one place, they'd say, you guys are nuts, and they just shut you off. Be very easy. So we crawl from different places. So the fact that we're crawling your local store, and we'll, let's say we're crawling 500 items in a day, we might only crawl three of them. Sorry, that's good. We might only crawl three of them from a local computer. Another three of them could crawl from California, and three of them are from China. They don't have any way to know what's going on. We can tell them that we're doing it, and they couldn't begin to trace it. There's no discernible pattern of what we're doing, and that's by design, because here's some of the other things that they're doing. If, if you're paying attention to Depot and you've seen it. In, the store, in a Home Depot store now, they have started to reassign store SKUs by store. So the SKU that store one uses is not the same SKU that the store two uses. And they're doing it only because they know what's happening with people with their cell phones. If you're standing there and you can scan the UPC, Lowe's no longer publishes UPCs on their website. Menards never does. So why are they doing that? Because they're getting killed by the internet. And everybody that's price shopping and price shopping a significant number of the items that they sell, if it's as easy as scanning the barcode using the red laser app or whatever one you're using on your phone, if it's that easy, they lose most of the time. So they've got to make it more difficult. Plain and simple. So the future of this is we know that we've got to stay ahead of that curve but our matching technology is, is superior and it's built just for our industry. It's not a, not, we aren't like the ones where you do, uh, you want to buy a video camera and you see, here are the 10 prices of video cameras and you can see all this. There is very much internet confusion being caused uh, intentionally with pricing. So we're trying to sidestep that, we're flying under the radar, we're trying to be as stealthy as they are, and I think that we've got that pretty well lit. Um, but the neat thing is by store, we now know what Home Depot store uses which of their skewed price models so we can continue to do our conversion behind the scenes. So when somebody else comes in and says, oh, I'll get you all Home Depot's prices, will you? Which ones are you going to get? Because they don't. They're in anybody that knows. And if they tell you they are, they're wrong. I'd like to see who's doing that. There isn't anybody that's done it. Uh, in fact, we have a patent pending on the technology that you need to get that information. So it's, it's pretty exclusive technology. But how, what does that mean to you is probably the big question that you really care about. If I now know Home Depot prices on four or 5,000 items that I sell, what am I gonna do with that in Margin Master, and how am I gonna use that? Well, from a Margin Master perspective, and let's go back to the old version of Margin Master. Works in both of them just the same. If I'm in the old version of Margin Master, and I wanna get my, my price, how many people had Rival Watch before? Remember Rival Watch? Some of you have, that was a, a, an older competitive data service that was out there. If you have Rival Master, and it is, it is an add-on service, it's not free, um, it's, it works about <coughs> 50 bucks a month, um, don't quote you to that, but it's about that, depending on how you want one competitor, two, three, you want seven, you tell us what you want, we'll tailor a program to you. Pricing is on our website, I'm not concerned about that. But to pick that information up, it's as simple as, oops, it's not an evil on this computer. <laughs> it's as simple as clicking that button, and what it does is it says to me, hey Brad, in this machine, you picked up competitive data through last Tuesday, or whatever that is. You want me to get the updates? 
you click yes, it goes out. It gets all the updates because it puts those are on our servers. So it downloads any updates that have happened since the last time you checked. If there's new items, they get added. If there's, if there's additional items uh, that come online, those come in on that. So we're keep, we keep track then internally, we're going to keep track of the last 12 months of Home Depot and Lowe's and Menards pricing. So what will also be available in the near future is the ability for you to click a SKU and say, show me what's happened to that SKU. So I'm looking at Kills Paint. It's $12.99 today. Click that button. It jumps you out. It's going to show you another the web page that says, here's their series of price changes that happened. Cool stuff. Okay. Um, how does that relate to my store, though? If I now have that information in Margin Master, if you haven't seen it before, what we, what we allow the program to do is display up to five of those competitors. Uh, it could be more, nobody's asked for more than five. Uh, but once that happens, let me make sure I've got turned on here. Let's make a quick here. If, I, if I've got competitive data, which I know I do not in here since I'm not enabled, I turn on competitor one, and competitor one, let's call them Home Depot, HD. Every selection then that I make, and I'm looking at that information, I do have some information. I see pricing in there in the Home Depot column that tells me what their price is for the items that I carry. And it shows it to me next to my, my item. So what was my cost? What's Home Depot? Again, not Home Depot in some other who knows where. The Home Depot down my street, the one that I picked. Pretty cool. The problem that we have, and I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that I don't know that it's an issue, is if we've only got 4,000 items for your store, or it's less than that, it's 1,000 items for your store, what logical decision am I possibly going to make, pricing-wise, off of 1,000 Home Depot prices? And it's pretty hard. There are some things that become obvious. Because uh, I, I could, I, again, I can use Margin National to ask some simple questions. Show me the things where my price is less than Home Depot's price. There's 396 of them here where, where this demo price is less than Home Depot's price. What would happen if I set those items up to Home Depot's price? I can play that game, but let's just say I take uh, uh, this primer and say it's deep data there, pay no attention. If I take that gallon, that quart of kills at the top. Home Depot's retail is reported at $9.98. Suggested retail is $10.49. I'm at $8.99. You can see how old my demo date is. But why would I be selling things below Home Depot retail? I maybe don't want to, but what I probably can't do, what doesn't make much sense, is to say, let's take this and set it to Home Depot's retail plus 5% or something like that. Because sitting next to this item on the shelf are other things that I don't maybe know about. The only thing I can logically do at this point is say, look, I realize there's something going on with that quart of kills. Let's check it out. And let's decide, hey, if my quart is wrong there, what other things do I have then that are related to my quart? And the way that I would do that is this. I pull up my quart and say, oh, that's class, that's class 198, group 6, whatever your structure is. So I pull up 198, group 6, and I'd say, what items are in there? Here's the items that are in that classification. Now, if I see Home Depot, I've got a fair amount of Home Depot prices there. I might be able to make a decision that would either allow it to affect this, even though I don't know what Home Depot's price is on that item. And let's think what a lot of items are that we sell. If it's a private label item, or we carry the, the off-brand item, and they don't carry it, I don't necessarily know that there's never going to be a comparison to the retails. But I can absolutely make some intelligent decisions based on what's going on. So you see, see kind of how that plays out? So here's, here's where that's going, though. This is where I get a little more excited. This, this, to me, this is old. This is the old use of, of the competitive technology. All I would tell you is our, our crawling technique today is better than anybody else's. That's it. Walmart. Walmart is absolutely on the radar, but guess what Walmart doesn't do? They don't publish UPCs either. So same thing. Anybody can be added. Orchard Supply. Anybody can be crawled. If they're publishing prices to their website, they can all be added. The 
problem with adding additional people is we need to have some translation from what their item number is on the internet to what their actual UPC is. I think we'll get there. And I think and if it's not us, somebody's going to get there. But there's absolutely an intent to confuse and create different numbers, and it, it's very difficult. Okay, yes? When I signed up for this, I gave you the best numbers that I saw, and then you translate the zero code better, I can give you the C code better. Right? You give me both. Both. You give me your, your SKU number. I don't care if it's you, but do a best SKU number. Um, but you give me your SKU and your associated UBCs. Every UBC. Every UBC. UBC. Even if it's not a valid UBC. Ah, okay. we'll, we'll filter them out. And the reason is we don't want to spend a lot of time trying to clean it up. But if you've got a UBC in your system and it's related to a SKU, we want to know, even if it's a dead UPC from 10 years ago, we'll just look at it and say, well, we don't know what that is. So if I continue to add new items every time I add new items, I need to give you UPC for yes. that Yes, and the process is, is built to be a simple process where we get the UPCs periodically, automatically, depending on when a cell system that happens to replace. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. You add, you add everything. Some people say, well, I keep the entire new best catalog in my system, so I'm going to have all those in. Maybe that's the way it is. So you're going to get more crawls. It doesn't matter. Which UPCs are in your system, that's what you can do the prices for. I feel bad when people do I think I did something wrong. I think they thought it was only an hour, and they were like, screw that, I'm getting the pricing plan. All right, so, so that's where I was. But where is it going in the future? I need, I need to open a few more screens. The fact that we've got the competitive data in our hands today is cool. We've got the technology to crawl the competitor and get their, the details about what we know about the items that they're selling. That's great. But what's really going to be cool is when we start then to add to the mix of items, not UPC to UPC match items. This is what most people have been participating in competitive data work for some time. This is what they're waiting for. It's coming. The idea that we sell a galvanized half-inch pipe metal, and they sell one, theirs comes from some foreign country, and ours comes from some other foreign country, they're the same item even though they'll never be the same UPC. What needs to happen for that to really make sense to us is we need to physically make the connection between this is their part number, or their SKU number, or their UPC number, and that's the same thing as our SKU UPC part number or whatever it is. When that happens, so in other words, if I took their their uh, half inch pipe metal and started said I want to know what's going on, I can I can tell you that information right now. But the thing we don't have is what matches that to our number. So here's where that kind of plays out. And what I think what I think is gonna gonna be the, the solution to the whole deal. And it's it's maybe a little little bit uh, I believe this can happen. And if you haven't heard of what's called a crowdsourcing model, this is the model that we're building, and this is what we're, we're hanging the success of growing competitive data in. And what that really means is we're going to turn it over to our users. And the users collectively join forces to do a small piece of work. This is actually the six steps that are outlined in what is, what is crowdsourcing. The company has a problem, the company defines the problem. We online source the crowd. We, we tell you what the problem is. You gather the information, and we reward the people that gather the information. So in other words, we need to know what the, home, the information is for Home Depot's half-inch pipe method. If I told 10 of you to go get it, uh, and you were part of the program, five of you might go do it. Right? We know that. So maybe I'd ask 20 of you to get 10 of you to go do it. But of the 10 that go do it, if nine of you come back and say, you know, that half inch pipe nipple is part of ABC one, two, three, guess what we know? We now know with a high level of certainty that part ABC one, two, three is the same as our part XYZ PDQ. Everybody that's part of the group then now knows what that half inch pipe nipple is at their local home depot. So you see how that kind of works? So here's, here's the way this kind of plays out. So if the subscription model for Rival Master is $50 a month, we'll just use that round number because it's simple. If I were to give you 50 SKUs a month and you don't get to pick them, I send you a list and say, here's the 50 items that I would give to you as an opportunity to go fast for us. 
I want you to find these six thermal couples, and I want you to find the water heater blanket, and I want you to find these types of things, just because we're targeting the water heater category that one. Okay? I'm giving the same list to you as I'm giving to other people. <coughs> Everybody goes out, some of you are going to Depot, some of you are going to Lowe's, some people are going to Menards. It depends on what your competition is. And of course, as our group grows, we get to go to more places and we need to cover more items. But at the end of that, we say, look, you've got until the 15th to get this done, and through your phone app, which we'll look at here in a second, you're going you're to type in that information and match it up. That information comes back in. We validate, hey, well, you know, nine out of 10 people say this is the same thermocouple as what we're selling. Everybody gets the thermal couple pricing for their own people. So we now go from having 4,000 matches per store to 4,001. And then two, three, four. The goal being, I think we could, we could conservatively do 500 items in a month. As, we, as our group of users grows, maybe we get 1,000 items a month. Well, if we did 1,000 items a month for a year, we just expanded the number of total matches by double. I mean, it would be pretty dramatic. And the more important thing to me is we get to do it in the areas that we want to target. So do I necessarily care what their pricing is on Christmas ornaments? It's probably not high on our list. But what we do get to do is absolutely the galvanized pipe fittings, that whole section, that should just be an over here. We, we need to know that. Electrical switches, do they have a single fold switch, 15 amp? What is it? It's not the same one we carry. Maybe they carry the level time, we carry, whatever. Let's match it up. And let's have multiple matches per item. So if you don't carry, you don't carry Leviton, you carry, you carry it in the contractor pack and they carry it, we need to know that. And more important than that, we need to know that this item isn't even the same, but here's how it will translate. So uh, the example I had up here is in a water heater case. Everybody sells a 40 gallon water heater. It's a natural gas water heater, the tall one. You know, Lowe's, Lowe's sells Whirlpool, Depot sells General Electric, most of us sell Reliance. Same item, same warranty. What information do we know if we can match that up? In fact, you can see pricing is very close on those. But take an item that's not the same. We sell a spray bottle of some cleaner. We sell a 16 ounce bottle. They don't sell the 16, they sell the 12. How do we match that up? So in addition to, hey, this is the same, this is an equivalent item, this is the conversion from their item to our item. So add to that the fact that not only is there this, theirs comes in a three pack, ours comes in a two pack, whatever that math is. Okay? Coming soon. Can a lot of that be done online though? Yes. But having just nipple, and I can find them through that, that just nipple very quickly online and find theirs and send that information in. Absolutely. If, if, if you can, yeah, that, however you pull that information, you can do it. So and then here's the reward part. Because I think this is key. Why is somebody going to spend their time doing it? Every one item that you're willing to do in a month's time, you're going to get a dollar's credit towards whatever your service fee is. So if you don't want to do anything, it's going to cost you 50 bucks a month to get the data and also get the benefits from the group's efforts. But if you don't want to spend a dime, or maybe you're already doing it, maybe you've already got somebody that's working on that, you just don't need to get these items. Maybe it's on the internet, all that happens. When you get those 50 items, you send them in, you're going to get up to a $50 credit for, for doing the work. By the way, if your answer is wrong, I'm not sure how this equates, but if you're really bad at matching items and you just throw in numbers, you're not getting a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow you've got to come up with the right answer. Right? That's some of the, the mystery of the model that has to be figured out. Now. But it's coming. Okay? And why is that so important? So we expand that number, and here's, here's I think, how this is going to this is so dynamic, and I'm just even pointing this stuff up. Is we all have our phones. Imagine I send you the list. You're on your phone, and you log into the app, and it says, here's my items. Now I'm in Home Depot with my phone, and it says, I'm looking for kills. There's kills. I'm looking for this. They, they generally be close to it. I'm looking for those thermocouples. So I'll do two or three items while I'm there, and I'm good. I didn't have to raise any red flags. As I'm punching them in, I'm done. There's no fill out a piece of paper in the mail it or fax it or go fill it. It can all be done ideally from, from the phone. <laughs> there is a problem with that though. We absolutely know that some items just aren't that similar or are going to be that easy. So the ability then to not only access it from a phone, but to go to a web page, again, log in. Here's the list of items that I'm trying to match up. 
If I click my item, it shows me what that item looks like in the Do It Best catalog. This is the item I'm looking at. Here's the, and I can then type in, here's what I think it is in Home Depot. Now I'm looking at a dual screen, my item, their item. Is this the same? Well, our manufacturer numbers this, there's a way, you know, there's, no, no, that's not the same one. Great, let's keep doing some research. Let's figure it out. But when I'm done, <coughs> the little match button, they're matched. Yeah. It could, it'll do both. I think the web page might be more useful sometimes. But let's add to that even one further step. You've got a, you've got a person that just likes to browse Home Depot and just likes to see what's going on. If I've got my phone and I'm in Home Depot and I see an item, this is, this is the way I shop Home Depot now anyways, I assume probably people do it the same way. I see an item, I'm like, we carry that. I don't know what we sell for, I don't know what our SKU number is, I don't know anything about it. With my phone, I can jump into the same application and just record your information say, this is an item I need to be checked. Now, now I kind of do the reverse. When I go back to my store, here's 10 items that I just checked at Home Depot. And I wasn't checking prices. I was just making note of the fact that I want their, their information. <coughs> Home would have the price. Now I'm back at my store. Oh, I'm looking for that item. I can walk to my aisle in the store. Oh yeah, that's that number. Is there a difference? Yes, it's the same size. No, it's got the same warranty. What are the differences? Done. I've added a match that wasn't even on my list. And I think there's some flexibility with that as well. How reasonable is it for me to expect people to do 25 to 30 <coughs> items a month? Does that seem reasonable? If you're part of the overall solution. Because what I really don't want to encourage is we don't do anything. We just sit back and suck from the rest of the people that are doing all the work. That's fine, but I think those people should maybe pay a little more. When this gets to be really critical, is when we cross the 10,000 item issue threshold, well, we know 10,000 of their UPCs that are common in, in most stores. And when your individual store now goes above 5,000 items and gets to 10,000 items, it gets to be pretty indispensable because now in Margin Master, and this, this is coming, it's not there yet. Uh, if I'm in here and I have Home Depot's price, instead of this just being a price, it's a hyperlink. So I'm like, how can they be $19.98 on that? Does that make sense? Click, opens up their web page, shows you that item. Oh, that's what they've got there. Here's that. Maybe it means send me a note. You know, that's not great. That's possible too. But the whole idea is the more of us that care, the better it gets. That tool that we're talking about using is the Pricing Master tool. It'll be free, the mobile app. Everybody can have it. The bonus that you get as a Bible Master user is when you're in Depot and you scan one of their items and you say, hey, I'm looking at their gallon of kills, it will also pull up for you your item that you have. So, hey, I'm looking at their kills. I know that I carry that. If, it, if we know the UPC, the UPC match, or we know the other match, it'll show you, it'll just say, show me my details. Oh, I'm, I'm $14.99, they're $12.99. I sold 26 of those last year. I'm okay with that. Maybe flag that so I can do some further work on that when I get back. So when you start to think about the information, well, this is one of the coolest parts of the new Margin Master. When will that be available? The Rival Master stuff is now. Pricing Master, I'm going to I'm gonna conservatively guess this fall. Some of you might see it before that. I'm not playing this stuff. I'm not going to roll out the crowdsourcing. <coughs> this, the crowdsourcing really is dependent on a tool to put it in. The, the conceptual part of which I was in my, I mean, I could give you all this right now and say, go, let's all go get galvanized pipe fittings. Here's the 50 items that we might get. I think we could do that in an ugly form right now, but I'd like to streamline the process. Okay. There are stores out there, by the way, um, I won't point fingers, I know who they are, that are, that are very good at gathering competitive data and have a lot of information available. And those stores as well should be so if you bring to the table and say, you know what, we already know 5,000 items that are the same at Home Depot, bring them out, we'll, we'll make it worth your time. How would you, how would you do the matching, say if we do it off the website, how would we match it? How would we get the information you need? You're just, you're just going to need to get their SKU number, and, and it's just a SKU to SKU. So this SKU is the same as our SKU, but then it's, is it identical? It's not identical. Is it, is it a different size? Yes, it's a different size. There's a 16 hours and 24. So I'll put their SKU into the pricing master app on the phone. Either on the phone or on the web page. So you might be running two web pages. Oh, so yeah. pricing manager web, web, web page. Yes. Oh, okay. yes. Just to be clear on the future, though, this is only going to be for the anomaly items. 
some Correct. of us are not, because you're still going to have the UPC to UPC match Correct. off crawling the website. Absolutely. We already have we already have that today. We're just talking about we're talking the things that are not not UPC to UPC matches. Right. They're but similar. Same, similar. Right. Yes. So it would be a way to differentiate if you're looking at your screen. It's a that is an excellent question, and I, I think there has to be. Um, I think that probably probably as you're seeing the Home Depot price, you will see some type of a symbol there that says. You know, that you can visually see. This is a UPC, this is a whatever. But because some of them aren't going to be even close. Some of them are going to be, this is only half the same as this. But we still want to know. The other byproduct of that, by the way, is if you're a lumber dealer and you want to match up your 2x4s two to their 2x4s, go right ahead. The rest of the country doesn't care what your 2x4 skew is. But you do. Match it up once, you now can crawl their home, the home depot's lumber prices and match them to your skew. Um, if I've got a regional player that's got a great website with pricing and everything yeah. like that, you guys, I can pay y'all 50 bucks and y'all search there as well. Well, I'll hold me to 50 bucks, but you show us who it is, depending on how easy their information yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, if they have all the information there. Yeah, I, I would think uh, that is certainly something you can Yes? You talk about regionalized pricing, which I know does exist with at least Lowe's and Depot. When you go to the website now, what is that price? To a, to a Home Depot or Lowe's store's price? Yes. Every price you pull up, you must specify which zip code or which price, which store you are in. Okay. So it gives so you that store's price. Right. It's, it's more than regional. It's storeized. Okay. They do very, within a region, they vary prices. They'll take Romex wire, three stores in the same town, and it'll be different prices in each place. Okay. So it, which store do you want? And you might say, I want, I don't have a, I don't have a depot, but I have two Menard or two Lowe's. You can pick two Lowe's. <laughs> so Lowe's one, Lowe's two is my question. So it's a steep, it's not Lowe's. It is, it is store specific. process that creates suggested details. But they very much are interested in the idea that what is a similar idea. They have spent a lot of money over the years trying to make similar matches happen. Um, and, and understanding how difficult that is to send. How would you send somebody out that's not been in the industry for some period of time and say, go match up these thermocouples? They can't do it. But we happen to have collective intelligence that we could we could talk about it and say, you know, is that the 30 inch or the 16 inch? Which one? You know, we know that without even talking about it. it Take somebody from the corporate office. Table. So that's been the challenge before. There's an accountability. There's a comp and, with and vendors, with vendors then when they see these with that buyer. I, I think it's gonna change the way that everything happens. Right. You know, because because there's been some thought of uh, and this this is being done in several vendors I know, where they apply a little bit of pressure to them and say, listen. We know you're selling the same stuff Home Depot, just tell us what their SKU number is. Well, if you're a vendor, why would you do that? You're giving Home Depot a 25 or 30 percent who knows what this tell. Maybe you don't want to reveal that information. But as it starts to come to light, it absolutely could change the game. I, that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it purely from a, a store perspective. What helps you make a better retail? And I think as we get more and more complete information, now we let's talk about the min max scenario. I don't ever want to be more than 30 percent above Home Depot. And I don't ever want to be less than Home Depot. So now you can start to set some parameters and really start to monitor things. And next month when we get another couple hundred items, are those hundred <coughs> items priced correctly in, in with my rules for Home Depot? How competitive do you want to be? Right now, today, we don't know. We just kind of fly blind and blah, blah, blah. That's changing. Okay, yes? You said you have about 11,000 correct matches. But, yeah, that number. How many? Uh, how many that was that was from the Do It Best catalog. How many so, indirect matches do you have? There are only UPC to UPC matches right now. That's all you have right now. That's all we have right today. 
Now, that said, we do have a number of stores that have shared with us, hey, will you go get these 500 items or these 1,000 items? So there are some additional items. But what we haven't done is just because you tell me that this is the item that you want to match, there needs to be a, a verification process. So the, the vetting of that data comes from that crowdsource power. If we have 10 people tell us the same thing, we have a pretty high level of confidence. Because I don't want to make the mistake of, hey, trust me, this is the same press wrench, and then somebody's, somebody's making a decision based on the information, and I go, well, that's not even a press wrench. That would be a problem. So we, it'll never be perfect, but we want it to be pretty solid. So. And you can set your sensitivity code against some of those accounts. I mean, I mean, set your strategies with strategies. sensitivity. said, the, the idea that you're describing is take all my sensitive items and make sure I'm Home Depot less plus 2% or Home Depot just plus rounds and maybe I don't do anything on that. You can do that now. The problem is, if I do that rule and I only know 2% of the items Home Depot price, what happens to the other items? So I have to, I have to take that extra step to expand my knowledge to a chunk of SKUs. That, this one that I pulled up is, is not a big one, but I think there's going to be a, a new screen that we're going to have it's going to, going to do this, and then this gets a little more into theory. If you know Home Depot's price on 60% of the items in the category, show me what their margin is, their equivalent margin. This, this might be your idea. Show me their equivalent margin uh, for using their my costs, their retails, and then tell me, all right, they're at 26%. I want to be at 36%. Those types of decisions by by some subset of students. Go ahead. You mentioned before that after core is one of the bigger group of members. Are you getting full support from them? <laughs> 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 um, all I will tell you, and I I refuse to play their their <coughs> system of bad mouthing. Mm -hmm. uh, I have heard, and I have not necessarily had first-hand knowledge, so this is pure hearsay. I have had many people come to me and say, they told me you're out of business. They told me that we are the standard solution now to do it best. They tell me this. They tell me this. Uh, I don't, I, all I tell people is like, you want to compare the tools? Please do. There is no comparison in my mind. I went through the demo with them. And, you know, it was just, they had a heck of a hard time with that. I went through the demo, saw the tool, show me what it does. It doesn't do any of the stuff we do with it. So if you've never done pricing before and you just wanted to get your retail to be rounded off a little bit, you can do that. But come on, I could have done that. They're not stopping. You know, no, they are stopping. And, and they're here's not why they're stopping and helping, you know, giving you what you need. They I mean, were an after core user we use margin rest, or all of a sudden we don't want to find out we're being we're suffering because they're not playing with They you. they absolutely for ten years have not made they would never admit to that. Maybe in a court of law I could prove that. But I'm, again, I'm not interested in that. Here's what I have that they don't have. I have 1,500 of their stores that use Margin Master. I've had maybe two or three that I know of that have signed on the pricing planner and said, oh, hey, I'm going to do that. <coughs> They've all come back. So what I don't get with the if they had a better tool, great. I, I appreciate it. That's cool. It's flattering to me that they want to do it. But their tool doesn't do what we do. So if somebody wants to pay them more money uh, for a tool that does less and put their hands of their support team, which we know what their support is, why would anybody do that? This is so cheap. It's proven to work, and you can ask people what the support is. I'm willing to hang my hat on that, and that's cool. There will be people that will do that tool, and, and it'll, it'll be a good improvement for them because they haven't done anything. But when they decide that, hey, we're not going to play nice with margin master anymore, they're going to have to answer to do it best. They're going to have to answer to haste. Because those people have told them you will make this work. Be sure to include your people that are signed up to you though also. I'm I, sorry? I would like to know if they if they don't want to play ball. Yeah, absolutely. Everything I can come up with to get away from them, I would love to do. I'm, I'm with you. I don't know. Sorry, you're not going to sell this. No, I get asked that all the time. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't, I don't have any desire to do that. This is, this is fun for me, and the fun part is this kind of thing. I mean, I've, I've gotten to know so many cool people. This is, this is fun. And, and being a little bit of a thorn in their side is kind of an added bonus. Because the same thing, in, in 15 years of paying them top dollar for support, that when, when a register goes down on a Saturday afternoon, they tell me, oh, you don't have coverage to get you that take care. I have four-hour coverage. What are you talking about my coverage? Oh, well, that doesn't apply to your zone. Well, you didn't have to take charge of me for that for the last 15 years. I mean, it just gets old. And hey, they do a lot of things well. Their point of sale system does what we need it to do generally. But come on, when they want to go out there then and, and tell my customers, it's, it's fun. I've had people come. Yeah, they tried to tell me that you're you're bankrupt and therefore you need to switch over. Everybody's switching over now. I'm like, okay. My favorite is they're hiring all my employees. I've heard of that. One. Okay, yeah, they've got two of my former employees. Uh, they'd like to scoop up a third one. But people in life tend to move on for different reasons, and because they've gone to different companies, does that mean that they're doing what uh, Epicor is in control? I'm just not going with it. You know, and, and I would tell that to them. I've had that conversation with, with their executives and said, well, why don't we work together? You know, why do you guys want to have their tool that's expensive and doesn't do it? They can have Margin Master work more closely with what they do, and it could be less expensive. And probably they could even make a little bit of money. They aren't making any money from what they do, I don't think. So that's fine. And there's more than them. There's other competitors out there. That's cool. Great. I will always hang our tool against somebody else's tool. All I ask of my users is if, if they come to you with a sales pitch and say, try, try it out. Tell me if they've got a feature that we don't have, show me what, what we're missing. Because I promise we're out there. We have inundated everything that's going on, and they're just trying to copy it. And not doing a very good job. So I appreciate everybody's time. I'm sorry I didn't know I had an hour. I would wrap this up an hour. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let me know.